Good afternoon, everyone. We'll be starting today's webinar shortly. For those of us, you who have joined us early, thank you. And uh, wanted to tell you that in the handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see there are two handouts there. Uh, one of them is the presentation we'll be using today. So if you click on that ASR Mix Design webinar presentation, you can download and print that out now. And you'll have a copy that you can look at closely and go through and make notes on uh, while we go through today's webinar. So we'll be getting started shortly. Thank you. An hour or so after the webinar is ended, we'll receive a copy of a link. And we will make sure that everybody who registered or attended today's webinar will get a copy of that link. Please feel free to use it to go back and listen or watch the webinar again. And feel free to share it with anybody that you wish. Um, very easy to pass it on to somebody else. They can take a few seconds, put in their name and email address, and, and they'll be registered, and they'll have access to this email. Uh, as we go along today, uh, if you have some questions, feel free to type them in. We're going to go over those questions at the end of today's webinar. So our agenda and our panels for today's webinar from the ASR Pro team, besides myself, Pat Bear is joining us from the lab in Harrisburg. Pat's going to review the specification development and go into the details of the new ASR specification that will be effective in April of 2018. Then Mark Moyer is going to take us through some mix design examples with different levels of aggregate reactivity. All the while, Susan Armstrong with Central Builders is going to be standing by to take your questions. And at the end of it, Susan will go through our questions and, and we'll discuss them with everybody. So with that said, let's begin. A few important facts about ASR. Uh, why we're here today is PennDOT is taking on and continue its leading role amongst the states for ASR testing and mitigation. Uh, a lot of time and energy and expense by aggregate producers and the lab in Harrisburg, some work over the past few years has brought us to a new specification and we're one of the first states to take on full implementation of PP65, now ASHTO R80 specification. Why do we need to do that? Because of some of Pennsylvania aggregates do have the potential to cause us damaging ASR, and that can shorten the service life of our highways, bridges, and anything else that we build. Along with that's the bad news is some very good news. Uh, with this new round of testing, now we've completed three years of testing. We've tested over 370 aggregate sources no other state has done this level of testing and we found some good news of that we can tell you very conservatively now that about 64 percent of our aggregate sources are non-reactive according to the most conservative tests that we have approved available for use now and that brings us to the fact is that our knowledge our understanding of asr our knowledge and our understanding of test methods for asr continues to evolve and continues to grow. With that being said, the ASR Pro team is committed to continuing its role of looking at the results within the state and also monitoring research and new things going on outside of the state to continue Pennsylvania's lead on this important topic. So, little background very brief about ASR. A for the alkalis. They come from the cement. They can come from other sources, but it's the alkalis that come from the cement that we're most worried about and can be most problematic. The S from the silica, that comes from the aggregates. It has to be the right kind of silica. And if you have enough of alkalis in the cement and the right kind of silica in the aggregate, they can form a reaction. They can form a gel. And if that gel is a type that likes to absorb a lot of water and water is present, you can have some very detrimental expansion. So there is the little devil up close and personal. You see ASR formed along that chert aggregate on this expanded view of a piece of concrete. Those 
little classy type things that you see laying, aligning all alongside the chert aggregate. They weren't there when that piece of concrete, this little piece of concrete was made. But this is the gel that grew. It formed and absorbed a lot of water. And when it forms and absorbs a lot of water, it can expand. And what happens? It can start cracking. The cracks start out small, but if the gel continues to absorb water and grow, they can expand. And so do we have ASR in Pennsylvania? Yes, we do. Right here is a picture of it from southwestern, south central Pennsylvania, two different sources that probably are ASR. Now, neither this sidewalk or set of steps has been tested to see it's ASR, but it does show the very distinguished, very distinguishing type of pattern, type of distress you see with ASR. The classic map pattern cracking the maps, the cracks in here are a little different from what you see from crazing. But why? Pretty sure that this is ASR. It's the telltale brown discoloration that you see right along the cracks that formed. So three things for needed for ASR, alkali, silicon, water. And it'd be very analogous to something we all know, something we all learned when we were kids, and that's called the fire triangle. We all know that you need oxygen, you need heat, and you need fuel to have a fire. Take one of those three things away, no fire. That's why we're all taught to smother a fire with a blanket or something like that. Take the oxygen away, the fire goes out. Same thing with ASR. We need all those three things. We need the alkalis, we need the silica, and we need enough water. Remove one of those, no ASR. To point that out an example, here's two pictures. Right now, this piece of sidewalk on the left is from the same site where I showed you those first pictures. But you see, that sidewalk only shows distress from ASR in one location. Pretty much can be assured that all that sidewalk came out of one load of concrete, but why only ASR at one spot? What you don't see on the left-hand side of your picture, and I apologize for that, is there's a downspout right coming out from the building at the lower left-hand side of your picture, dumping water underneath that sidewalk. So here again, the water is giving some of the fuel to the reaction. The picture you see on the right is a precast concrete barrier. This is from eastern Pennsylvania. And it's rare, you can say, to actually go out and see ASR in many places. One of the places where it's not rare, it's not really common, but it's not rare, is in precast medial barriers, precast panels. Why is that? Well, the concrete used to make that precast barrier probably has about 800 pounds of cement per yard in opposed to the five or 600 that we would use for our normal structural concrete. Uh, with more cement comes more alkalis. And remember we said earlier, you have to have enough alkalis. Well, one of the ways of the new test methods is, is there's a threshold limit for alkalis on each one of the aggregates. And unless you come up to that threshold limit, you may not have ASR initiated. So here, more alkalis gives you more frequency for ASR. Now, those two previous slides, the sidewalk and the medial barrier, they're probably not going to bust anybody's budget and they'll probably give us a long enough service life. However, if you have ASR in a critical bridge structure like you see here, and to my knowledge, this bridge is not in Pennsylvania, but it is one of the most photographed bridge arounds because this bridge is the poster child for ASR. This type of damage can hurt anybody's budget in any one of our districts. So with that, we're going to switch over to Pat at the lab. Pat's going to take us through how we got here and some details in the new specifications. And you'll give us just a minute. I will switch over to Pat. Pat, are you there? Yes, I am. All right. Good afternoon. And we will switch over to you as a presenter. Okay. Is, uh, everything look good? I believe so. Let me switch over to the next slide and make sure we're... Please do. It's not coming. Okay, here we go. There we go. Okay. Yes, Wonderful. you're all good. Take it away, Pat. Thank you. Okay, okay thanks. Um, good afternoon, everyone. 
Um, as Jim said, I'm just going to give you a little bit of, of, of history of, of um, the research and, and things we did back in the 90s, and then an idea of um, how we came up with the, the current spec and that, that we're going to be using. So basically, um, Interstate 84, back in the 1990s, is a 12-year-old pavement uh, that exhibit cracking and center line deterioration. It was that happened to be the earliest discovery of ASR on a department-owned um, uh, pavement. So at that time, there was a Mid-Atlantic Task Force that was formed. Um, there are um, states around us that also uh, deal with with ASR. So. Uh, we joined the task force, um, and, and that task force came up with a set of, of documents. The uh, mortar bar test that is, is now T303 uh, originated in, in South Africa, uh, and uh, basically that is what we have been using up until a couple years ago. That task force also came up with um, strategies on how to re remediate um, the uh, ASR. In, uh, as, in 1991, then, once the, uh, the, the T303 testing was, was um, put in place and we decided that that's what we were going to go with, we, had, we decided to, to test several aggregates uh, to, to see what our, our numbers look like, to see what, uh, uh, whether or not we have had reactivity. So uh, we, we started testing. Um, we found that uh, the, the several of the aggregates that we did test it had a potential for being highly reactive. reactive. Uh, so in 1992, we started testing um, all of the aggregates that would have been used in, in um, construction at that point, 57, the, the fine aggregates that would have been used in concrete. Um, of those 464 aggregates that we tested, about 75% um, had expansion over uh, the, the 0.10%, uh, which would have made them uh, reactive based off of those test results. Um, <clears throat> so basically, uh, we implemented a standard special provision that um, based on the accelerated mortar bar testing, uh, you know, which we, uh, we, we did on all of it, uh, that we would uh, mitigate and, and use posilins at different levels to uh, mitigate for the potential of the ASR. Um, it, it, although the T303 is a, at that time, um, a, a, a good test, uh, it, it can and it, and it did generate inaccurate results. So, so basically, you know, you could have an aggregate that tested negative but actually was um, uh, reactive and you had uh, basically ASR show up in, in the field. Um, straight out of the 408, basically, it, it, uh, it's the different levels of, of mitigation that uh, currently are in the, the specifications. Um, so, you know, if you are over 0.1% expansion and uh, less than 0.4, you know, fly ash should do 15 to 25% and then 20% minimum of if you're over the 0.4. And you know, low alkalized cement can be used, uh, blended cement, things along those lines. Um, uh, also, it, it, the current spec has said that, uh, you know, we can allow a reduction um, if independent testing shows that a lesser amount of pozzolin will, will give you the, the, the same uh, mitigation level of, of below 0.10. So, um, basically, we had some significant uh, pavement failures. Uh, we had some in District 4, District 6, and District 8. Um, I'm sure there have been more uh, projects that, that showed deterioration in ASR. 
these just happened to be the ones that um, we were involved with uh, basically analyzing and, and giving a definite yes or no that ASR w was involved. Um, just to, to give you an, an idea too, some of these uh, projects that we looked at, the aggregate was, was identified as, as not being reactive. Um, so, so basically, it, it, uh, yes, we, it, we needed to come up with something better uh, to, to give us a, a, a better idea of what our aggregates are like, what's reactive, what's non-reactive, and, and whether we are mitigating at, at proper levels. Um, also, uh, while we were doing all of this, and I'll go into the, to the history of what FHWA did, but um, you know, FHWA is, is also developing an ASR inventory um, to, to assist states and to, to keep track of, of, of what's out there in the, in the different departments. So we were given a, a directive um, by upper management to form a pro team uh, to accelerate the implementation of, of corrective action plan. Um, we needed to identify uh, short-term stopgap solutions to implement immediately, and then um, specifications for, for long-term. Um, so this is what we did. We, um, we did a, a, we put together a protein uh, for the short-term solution. We did a standard special provision, and the long-term solution, we decided to take a look at, at what FHWA had been doing for five to seven years um, prior to this, and uh, the uh, ASTRO PP65 is, is what they had developed from that. Um, give you an idea of, of um, what ASTRO had done and their, their ASR program. It was launched in 2006. Um, basically, their goal was to increase concrete pavement and structural durability and performance and reduce life cycle cost through the prevention and mitigation of ASR. So basically, they came up with um, two different uh, documents. One is, is was the ASTO PP65, which is now ASTO R80, if you're going to go out and take a look for it. And then also a report on diagnosing um, and mitigating of, of ASR in uh, uh, structures. Um, I do know that this group will continue its researching, and um, we, the, the department, um, has asked that uh, future research that we be in included as, as part of the group so that um, uh, we can be in the forefront of, of, of what's being looked at and what's being developed on, on the national level. So uh, September of 2013, we had our kickoff meeting, which gives you an idea of who all was involved with it, uh, Central Office, BOMO, District, um, PACA, ACPA, and um, the, the precast uh, people were also involved. Um, we, uh, at the very beginning, we had a lot of the, uh, the lead ASR researchers involved, and they were made available to us so that we could um, you know, uh, they could answer questions. We could, you know, it was, it was very helpful, especially in the in the beginning stages, to try to kind of get our head wrapped around um, the the spec because it 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 not it it's gonna be a little difficult and challenging to to follow until you you get used to it. So, um, so. Uh, again, our current policy, uh, the standard special provisions, uh, just to kind of make a note here that at that time, uh, we currently do not, do not have any kind of uh, repeat testing for sources. Uh, we did not establish any kind of frequency. A new source came in, we would test it. Um, that will be changing in, in the future. Uh, we will be retesting uh, sources on a regular basis uh, with the new uh, 1293 testing. Uh, so for the stopgap measure and what was considered, um, basically the risk of continuing 
uh, uh, current uh, aggregate testing and and needing to protect our future assets. Um, so basically, uh, what we decided to, to come up with, and I think uh, the percentage beforehand was 75, 74, 75 percent of our aggregates were reactive. Anyway, so we decided to um, just mitigate everything. Uh, you know, we basically, you know, decided that 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 would be the easiest way to uh, make sure that we protect our our assets in the future until we we figured out and got through our our, our testing regimen with the uh, with the the new PP65. Um, Basically, and as everybody knows, uh, the past oh geez, handful of years, we've had issues with shortages, uh, you know, especially of the of the fly ash. So, um, industry was 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 brought in and talked to and, and made sure that um, we would have a, enough materials if we were to go through with this to um, to you know sufficiently take care of all the concrete in, in the state. So, um, I. Seem to work. I didn't. I don't believe I heard of, of many sh uh, shortages in, in the field. Um, again, a little bit of information on standard special provision. It, it went through fairly easily, and, and uh, had some minor comments, and uh, went to FHWA for final approval. Um, so, to the the next step again was the the long term uh, solution. And uh, in order to do that, uh, we were not set up in-house to do testing of 400 sources, um, especially that involved getting set up with a warm room and uh, new molds and, and new containers to hold the, uh, the, the prisms in. So it, it, uh, we decided to go to four independent labs to help us on the first round of testing. Um, and, and to let everybody know, to, to clarify this, um, in the future, we are, the department is now set up with uh, two warm rooms, which means that we are able to do 100 samples a year. So any future testing will be done in-house and, and suppliers will not have to spend the extra money to go out and have that independent testing done on a, on a regular basis. Um, we are talking about, and this hasn't been uh, totally uh, set in stone yet, but it looks like an approximately a five-year cycle is what we're going to be doing for reevaluating um, all of the aggregates. So. Sorry to get off track, but uh, to get back to the evaluation and what we did, uh, we drafted a letter to all type A aggregate sources. Um, basically, we worked with four independent labs, uh, NRMCA, CTL, AEG, and Bowser Warner. Uh, we had extensive um, phone conversations with them because, as, as many people are aware, uh, tiny little differences in testing can can skew certain tests, so we wanted to make sure that everybody was on the same page. And um, basically, in here at the department, we had a we got a warm room set up, and and we kind of did a spot check of the the, the four um, independent test testing labs to to try to keep an eye on everybody's test results and make sure everybody was in line and and. Things turned out very well. Uh, testing was 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 very very well and, and good. Um, uh, districts and and QA were a huge help with going out and and gathering samples and and again thank you all for that. Greatly appreciated. Um, so so basically. Uh, when the letter went out to uh, the type A aggregate sources, um, some people opted to not participate in it. And um, because of that, their, their, all their T303 testing and stuff will be removed. There will be a note in the bulletin that states that they are, their material cannot be used for 
for Pine Creek. Um, we basically, because of the amount of sources, we did uh, two rounds of testing. It is a, a year-long test. Uh, we kind of split things up at the 0.15 um, uh, test limits on the T303. Um, so we, we did two rounds of testing, which, which took over, over two years. Gives you an idea of what the, the testing looks like. The uh, accelerated mortar bar, the, the T303, which we do, the, also the ASTM uh, C1260, uh, is on the right-hand side, and there, the rapid mortar bar testing. It's a very aggressive test. Um, it gives you an idea of what the prison test looks like and, and an idea of what you know, we had to come up with um, for, for testing in half. Okay. Um, basically, uh, PP65 has, has two different approaches for ASR prevention, um, the performance pro approach and then the prescriptive approach. Um, the, our spec uh, and that what I'm going to go over is the prescriptive approach. We also will allow a performance approach, which is basically a two-year duration concrete prism test. Um, so say you've got a, uh, a, a source that is, is very, very reactive and they would like to take an idea of, of whether or not their material could be mitigated at a, a lower percentage than what of, of pozzolans than what is, is called out for the prescriptive approach. Um, you know, we, we are allowing that. So you, you basically you go through, you do the, uh, the prisms at the lower amount, you go through the two years of testing and see what the, um, uh, see what the, the results are like. Also, the uh, you know, field performance, we are, we are looking into to that. There will be some parameters that will be set up that will be necessary, and, and uh, all that will be outlined also. But um, let's go into the prescriptive approach here, and, and uh, I'll give you an idea of, of what it is like. Um, and it looks like I got a little bit ahead of myself and, and all this stuff. <laughs> That is on there. I've already went over, um, except for the, the. I'm sorry. The the one thing on that slide that I did not go over is a new source. So um, a new new source that comes in, we will be doing uh, the Astro T303 testing, which is the the uh, rapid mortar bar. They will be giving a a number based off of what's in PP65 for mitigation. Um, but because of the chance that it could still be, you know, if it's if it's saying it's non-reactive with the T three or three, um, we decided to, you know, it will be still listed as an R one, as 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 being slightly reactive, just until the C twelve ninety three year long prison test is finished, and then um, that T three or three number will be taken out, and the new reactivity number will go in. Um, so I, I, I guess I, like I said, went a little bit ahead of myself and, and uh, went ahead and covered stuff on that slide. So PP65, um, we decided to try to make it a, a little bit easier to, to, to follow. So I'm going to give you an idea on these next slides of what PP65 looked like and then what we did to, to make it a little bit easier for everybody to, um, to, to follow and, and understand. So the um, classification of aggregate reactivity is basically the same in, in our draft spec and PP65, and that goes into the R0 through R3 classifications for the uh, C1293 test result and the T303 test result. So uh, the level of risk, um, basically the, the lower half of the slide shows you the level of risk for PP65. Um, we kind of narrowed it down so that it's, it's a little bit um, easier to follow. Um, you know, your R0 will have a, a risk level of one, 
R3 will have a risk level of four. Um, you know, because we did not go, um, it, also the, the uh, PP65 has a, a risk level of five and six. Um, again, we narrowed it down so that we've got four risk levels and there's um, three uh, classifications of, of structures, again, to make it uh, a little bit easier to follow and, and, and understand. Uh, the, the different uh, structure levels, uh, or the classes, I should say, structure classifications, this is what is in PP65. Um, to make it a little bit easier, and so there's no uh, there's no interpretation. Um, you know, when you say that some minor safety and future maintenance consequences are associated with with an S2, um, we just went ahead and the 408 publications that are related to those three different structure classes, we had and went ahead and listed it. So that um, there is no, uh, there's, there's, it'll be just very clear. You know, if you're if you're paving under 501 back or 506, then you are under a structure classification of, of an S2. I hope the changes that we made make it a little bit easier for everybody. Um, again, the table G is the minimum uh, level of. Uh, uh, Supplementary uh, cementitious materials that can be used. That uh, again is is the same. Um, also, uh, low alkali cement. Uh, basically, if you use a low alkali cement, it um, it drops you by one preventive um, level. The one thing, if you see here in red, that I wanted to make sure that everybody realizes is. Um, you can use a low alkali cement to drop one level, but you cannot use it to not mitigate. So if you have an, an R1 classification and you have to mitigate, let me see if I can go back here to the level. Um, you're at a, a level W and um, you want to use a low alkali cement it does not drop you down to a level V where you don't have to use POSLAs. Um, you, you will still have to use, if you've got a, a reactive aggregate, you will still have to use um, some sort of POSLAs. So if you're at a level X, to give you a better explanation, and you lose, use a, a low alkali cement, it drops you down to a, a level W. Okay. Um, Again, a prevention level Z, which is very, very highest, um, you have to use a uh, maximum alkali content of, of 3.0 and uh, um, a minimum uh, SEM level uh, Y from uh, table G. Okay, uh, this will be in, in the spec also. It's, it's basically a flow chart that takes you through how to figure out what um, percentage of pozzolans uh, that you need to use. Okay, so uh, Mark is going to go through some some actual mixed designs, but I wanted to um, I wanted to just show you an idea of of going through uh, an aggregate. So you say you're using a, a this a course aggregate from ABC uh, quarries, and you wanted an idea of, of how much pozzolan to use in 506 paving. I'm just going to go through one quick example so you have an idea of, of how you look at the spec and, and how you go through that process. So um, using a course aggregate with a reactivity of 0.18 and a fine aggregate with a reactivity of 0.03. So uh, the coarse aggregate is, is basically um, is, is, is an R2, which is highly reactive, and the fine aggregate is, is an R0 reactivity class, which is basically non-reactive. So for any mixed design, like we did before, um, you use the highest reactivity level of, of any aggregate used. 
So uh, the, the next step is to figure out the level of ASL risk. According to Table D, um, we are in an R2, so your risk level would be at uh, risk level three. So uh, the next step is to determine the level of prevention. Uh, so you need to take an idea of what the structure classification needs to be. Um, so, so an idea of for a mixed design for 50506 paving would be a structure class of S2. If the mixed design was going to be used under Section 530, long life concrete pavement, then we would be under the um, S3 structure class. So um, let's say that uh, you're for this particular sample. We are, um, again, uh, designing under Section 506 RPS uh, pavement. The structure class would be S2, as we just discussed. So determining the level of prevention, you are at a risk level three. You are at a structure um, classification of S2. You would be at a, a prevention level X. So you go over here to prevention level X, we'll show you what is your, your minimum prevention uh, levels that you need for fly ash of different alkali levels and um, uh, GGBFS and silica fume. So that basically wraps up everything that um, I was to give. And, and Jim, if you could um, hand it over to Mark. Um, uh, thank you, Pat. And Pat's going to be staying with us uh, for the question and answer period. And right now we're going to switch things over to Mark Moyer at his office in uh, near Altoona, PA, and for a new enterprise stone and lime company. Mark prepared some examples for us, and he's going to take us through a few mixed design examples. Are you there, Mark? Yes, Jim. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you okay. How about the screen? Screen okay? Uh, let's why don't you advance to your next slide just to make sure. Am I am I on the notes page or am I on the correct page? Uh, one second, please. Yeah, I, I see it says R zero example. Okay, that's all you're seeing now. You see the table. Yep, you, are, you are good. So take it away, okay. Mark. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Pat's and Jim has alluded to, this has been quite a tasking process over the past several years. So I'm going to take you through about a total of four mix examples. No need to try and take notes. Download the PDF file and look at them later. Jot down any questions. Susan will be taking those at the end of this webinar. Now I did receive a couple contacts, Jim, just so you're aware from a few people, Juan Pendot, saying they're not seeing the handouts tab for some reason. So I don't know if that's an issue for some or for all. Okay. For for those, then make sure that you may have to expand your GoToMeeting uh, toolbar on the right-hand side. If you see an orange arrow anywhere in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you may click on that, and I believe that will open up your toolbar if it accidentally got compressed. And then you'll see a bunch of sections where it says webcam, audio, dashboard, etc., and you'll see the handout section. So hopefully that helped a few people. If you still have questions, please type them in the question thing. But before you get to the question thing, you can probably see the handout, so it's a little bit redundant. So um, any more, uh, get a hold of Mark or I during the webinar for here, and then we'll try and, and help you out as things go on. So back to you, Mark. Okay, thanks, Jim. All right, so Pat has explained to you guys all about the different R's. R0 is the first example I'm going to give you, okay? The value found in Bulletin 14 online, you'll see, we will always use the higher of the two values, as Pat alluded to in the closing of her presentation. So if you're, if you're a new source, brand new, and you just come online, Pat, correct me if I'm wrong, LTS will perform T303 for a more quicker value until 1293 is completed. And as everybody can see on the screen, for the example of R0 we have for the one I'm going to use is less than or equal to 0.04. Pat's phone number is on here if in question. 
Uh, Pat, hopefully you're not gritting your teeth at me for giving your phone number on here. As we continue on, we're at an R0, so our risk level will be 1. The table E, we follow risk level 1 over to S3. Now, note my examples are all going to be S3, which are much more practical. The same slide. By using an S3 for all of your mixes, this would indeed cover any other mixes that may only need to be an S2 or an S1. Also, this will greatly reduce the amount of potential mixes. So our PennDOT folks listening are probably thinking everybody design S3, save a lot of, a lot of headache and a lot of um, evaluating of the mix designs. If your aggregate is indeed less than 0.04 or equal to, it will be a level V, which there is no need for remediation. But as we go through this, and I'm going to be using all PennDOT Class A mixes for this for our examples today. You start your redesigns. I would strongly encourage all of you to consider using the ACI Table 6.3.6 .6 for determining your course aggregate volume. Remember, as well, you can adjust your volume plus or minus up 10% as needed for workability and pumping. So for a Class C, obviously, you would likely adjust your volumes up over 11 cubic feet, as also with slip form pavement. But the cement factor, water cement ratio, and air are all given per section 704. So we know our max WC is 0.47, 6% air. We have 102 pounds per cubic foot dry rotted 57s. Per our table, at one inch nominal aggregate size out of, out of ACI 211, our 102 times 0.67 in the drop down table times 27 gives us our weight per cubic yard of 57s. So because we're not mitigating, this is an R0, this is 588 straight cement, 1845 57s, 276 of water, and the remaining volume is 1202 of sand. There is a final mixed proportion in, in volume. Uh, I threw specific gravities in, basic specific gravities, just for referral at a later time. Going through now to an R1 example, I'm going to be utilizing primarily GGBF, GGBFS, since the majority of all DOT concrete utilizes it. It's not a slight to any of the fly ash people, but there are the majority of the mixed designs from what I understand from PennDOT have primarily slag cement. Again, note the reactivity of your aggregate per bulletin 14. Make sure they're up to date. Again, using the higher vol value of the coarser fine aggregate. As Pat reiterated, please understand if you have something that's uh, 0.13 and your other value is 0.04, you're gonna be using clear up to an R2, or in this case, if it's a 0.11 and your sand is non-reactive, you're still going to be using an R1. This is a step further from the last example. We're going to a risk level two. We're going to design again everything per S3, which is going to be a structure class three, which is going to be a risk level for X. Shoot back to there. There's the same table. I'll show the whole way through. Please note at the bottom, Determined based on the allowable risk, always use a higher S class. I'm going to reiterate that probably 10 plus times in this presentation. So we are going to be using a 35% slag on a level X. The values are again for a cement factor, water cement ratio, and air. We're taking our 588 cement for, for, for our double A times 35%, which gives us our weight of GGBFS, subtract from our 588. And I know a lot of this is redundant and repetitive to most people who know mixed designs, but not everybody on the, on the, on the call is, is acclimated with it. We're going to use the same ag course aggregate to make things simple, the same 102 dry rotted FM, nominal aggregate size, 1845. Okay, our final weight, 382 of Portland, 206 of slag cement, 1845 again of 57s, 276 of water, 
There's our volumes based on the specific gravity. This is also where I'm going to put a shameless plug in for PACA's Concrete 101 and 201 design classes. If you guys need to brush up on any of this, and this isn't uh, reminders for all of you guys, Jim or Susan can give you the details after this webinar. Now we're going into an R2 example. This R rating has the least amount of sources supplying to the Commonwealth. After all the testing was done over all the sources, the fewest amount are R2, but there are some, and there should be people on the line listening. So in the design phase, please pay real close attention to your early breaks. I suggest even making additional cylinders for information only, early breaks, four or five days. Again, nothing official. And also, during our pro team days, we also mentioned about using non-chloride accelerators for these high, higher poslin amounts. Uh, currently, there's nothing on in Section 704 restricting them. This obviously will be a supplier's business decision if they decide to use that. So here is our R2 example. We have, again, get this value, the higher value of the course of the fine aggregate. Based on that will be a risk level three. Again, S3 to minimize the amount of mixes. This will be a Y. So level Y down to slag cement, GGBFS, is 50%. Following the flow of level Y, there's where we get. Some of you maybe perhaps already use 50% slag in some of your PennDOT mixes currently uh, for summertime. For others, this may be uncharted territory. So we're going to go through the simple math of it again. 588 total, 50%. It's a real easy number. 294 of GGBFS, 294 of Portland cement, water cement ratio of 0.47, 6% air. Same course aggregate to minimize any muddying of the water of examples. And then here will be our final mix weight our final mixed volumes. And our last example, our fourth example, is a ternary. <clears throat> now this is, things can get a little bit tricky. As many of you guys know on the line, definition of ternary is basically an adjective meaning composed of three items. In this case, there'll be two poslins and one cement. And this is note three from table G. I sort of par paraphrase it in there with two or more SCMs, supplementary cement materials, are used in combination, the minimum mass replacement levels given in Table G for the individual's SCMs may be reduced, provided the sum of parts of each SCM is greater than or equal to one. What does that really mean? Well, and in other words, the flash could be reduced a third, provided the GGBFS is two-thirds of the required level. Two-thirds and a third is one. So we're going to use the same example of the R2 that had 50% slag, it's going to be a risk level three. And again, this is going to be Y with an S3. Now, here's where the footnotes really comes into play. And I, I have the footnote down here. I'm not going to read it again to you. But I want to use both Flash and GGBFS, not only for logistics or business reasons, but maybe performance. Uh, there is one district in particular that used, turtle, used utilized ternary and, and their deck several years ago, and several producers are still using that, uh, even though it's no longer required. Others may not be able to do it due to plant bin capacities. So I'm going to go through a ternary with you. So you can use force, but in the case of the example I used, I use thirds. So again, I, I don't don't let the math bother you. You'll be able to look back at this later on your handout. A third of the 25% fly ash two-thirds of the 50% slag. 0.33 is a third times 25% fly ash, 0.67 times 50% slag cement. Our, our net gives us 8.2% fly ash and 33.5% slag. You could use this in lieu of using 50, straight 50% slag, okay? Now, those who use the blended cement could really get into a bit of a contest with that if you had wanted to use fly ash and a blended cement. I don't know that I want to go down that avenue with our discussion today. Again, the same 
aggregate structure, 102 pounds per cubic foot dry rotted, FM of the sand is 280. It's a one inch nominal aggregate size per ACI 211 table 636. There's our math, there's our coarse aggregate volume or weight, and this will get us our final, final weights of the mix. 342 of Portland, 197 of GGBFS, 49 pounds of type F fly ash, 1845, 276, and 1181. And there's all your volumes, okay? Here's the final mix. I also would recommend uh, doing some lab tests because the setting time that I have found personally of this turn area is very similar to 50% GGBFS. I know I went through everything very quickly. This is where I'm finished. Susan and Jim will take over with questions. I thank you for your attention. I hope you've learned something from today's webinar. Again, shameless plug for PACA's Concrete 101 or 201. We take all day to go through the things that I just went through in about 15 minutes. Uh, Jim, I guess you'll take it from here. I will, Mark. Thank you. And uh, Pat, I think you had some something else that you wanted to show for us. And Mark, just hang on while I take your screen back. But Pat, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, there was uh, a couple things that I uh, I forgot to mention. Um, basically, we we've waited until um, things got wrapped up and sent over to FHWA for approval to go in and pull out the old P three hundred three numbers. So um, Mike Matthews is doing that for me right now. So basically, you know give us a, a week or so, but um, go in and check to make sure that, uh, you know, your numbers look like they're supposed to be and your 1293 numbers are in there and your T303 are, are pulled out. Now, again, there, there are two exceptions to that. Um, new aggregates that are, are being put in the bulletin will have T303 testing done. And then there was a handful of um, aggregates and, uh, uh, the the DME should should know which ones they are from their their district um, that something happened with the sample or something went wrong that um, we are currently testing them in house right now for the 1293 but their T303 numbers will be will be put in in the bulletin um, again please everybody I I went through and I found a couple that have been missing that we need to get in there. But if you find something is, is not right or something is missing, please let me know somehow. Um, uh, also, to let you know, I, I got an, an email from um, Jennifer Albert. Um, she currently has a spec with her, and hopefully we will be getting um, approval from them uh, shortly. I, I don't know how long it might take them to go through everything. It is is pretty lengthy. Um, spec and, and everything that goes along with it. Um, so with, with that being said, um, there technically it's the same spec, but there are some verbal changes made to it. So when we get the finalized draft that's approved from FHWA, I will get it sent out to, um, to the DMEs and, uh, and PACA, so PACA can distribute it to industry. Um, but what I need you to do is all the draft stuff that I've sent out and everybody is using, please get rid of that so that there's no confusion. Um, I wanted to make sure everybody had something in their hands to look through, but I also was hesitant about getting something out there that, that's going to be used after the, the final spec is, is, um, is, is done and, and, and approved. So if you could do that for me, I would appreciate it. And that's all I had, Jim. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Pat. Um, Susan, looks like we've had a few questions come in. Uh, are you there, Susan? Yes, I am. All right. Uh, take it away, Susan. All right. The first question I had is, how will the new ASR requirements impact the existing Walsh P3 bridge program? Jim, am I, am I muted or am I? No, nope. we can hear you, Pat. You're live, okay. Pat. Okay. Um, I will tell you there's been some discussion here this morning about that. Um, some things need to be finalized. 
and uh, the necessary people will be contacted with that information. How often are you looking at retesting? I know you said a five-year cycle, but what's first? Yes. Um, I still need to get all of that worked out with, with the new uh, chief materials engineer. Okay. How often will we have to redo our mix designs if nothing changes? Um, I don't want to speak for the DMEs. Um, I, I don't know what the standard practice is in each district with changes to specific gravity. I'm assuming that stuff's going to be updated every year with a paper copy. I don't know about mixed design, <clears throat> things along those lines. Pat, Pat um, real quick, along that same line, if somebody already, and I think I alluded to it in one of my slides, if somebody already is using, say, 50%, and they wouldn't need to even be using that much, in theory, their design might still be good, correct? Correct, yes, yep. So some may not have to redo any design. Correct. Okay. One of the last Sorry, questions. I have, that's okay. Um, are they? Are you guys going to modify the mix design form so that it'll say what structure type the mix design is? Um, yes. Yes. That that will be done. Um, I believe, though, Mark, correct me. I think you had sent um, something over that had the the structure class, where did you put that in, in your I mix just design? I just put it in the in the identifier portion of the new ECAMs. When you put the identifier in, some people put 35% GGBFS, some might denote SF paving, some might denote pump. Uh, the ones that I did have the, the Poslin amount, and then there's a comma, and then there's the identifier being pump or whatever, and then in parentheses, I have them listed as S3 because I mentioned on here with my examples, I did everything with S3. So there's plenty of character space there to put it in the identifier. It'd be in the upper right-hand corner of the actual mix design. Okay. Sounds like a good location to put it for now until we can get something on the mix designs. Okay. Jim, I could drag one over to the screen if you want it. Um, kind of not set up to do that right now, Mark, but thank okay. you. Okay. Susan, I had some questions come in, if, if that's all that you had. Uh, the only other one is, is how are we to know what structure type is required? Where are we supposed to find that? Um, if you, I, I don't know, you can go back to, to my um, slide, Jim. Yes, hang on. I just, everybody, let me just fly through there. I think I know what you need here. Forgive everybody for me going through this so fast, but hang in there. For example, I think that's the one you want, right, Pat? Uh, this one right here. Yep. Yeah. So if you, if you take a look at the publications on the right hand side of the screen and figure out what section of the floor weight your 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 item is, um, whether it's um, you know concrete pavements or structures or uh, overlays or, or what it is, and then um, that will tell you what structure class um, you need to use. Hopefully that answered the question. If not. Please yep. type in, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer it. That's all I have, Jim. Okay. Um, I have a question that came in uh, from Western Pennsylvania. How this, will this affect accelerated set mix designs? Um, I, I, the, I've had several um, districts ask about that, and I've actually had um, some producers that have tried it at the higher percentages. And from what I, I've been told, they were able to get their strength. Yes, um, we were. Okay. So I, I was going to I was going to put you on the spot. I didn't want to put you on the that's spot, okay. Mark, but um, yeah, that's okay. Uh, yeah, they uh, Mark was able to 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 get even at the higher positive levels was able to get his um, his strength with the accelerated uh, mixes. Okay, next question that came in from out from the West, and we may have touched on it briefly here like that, but uh, where will um, ASR values be noted on the mix design for acceptance?
Um, any well, different from the slot that we have now for that, or any changes anticipated to the mix design form? It's already on there. There's a spot for ASR. Right. Um, so I guess the question is, will that be the 1293 numbers and not the T or three or three numbers? But it, it, it will be for the 1293, except for those new sources that only have T three or three numbers. Yeah. So that that is something that looks like we're going to have to make sure that we get cleared on it as we switch over. Um, another question came in. There was some discussion prior to that that everybody's just going to maintain their 2017s under. Uh, agreement until April of 2018. Is is that still going to be the policy moving ahead? Correct. Okay. But we are strongly encouraging everyone to start on their redesigns now. Am I correct? Correct. Okay. All right. Um, there, another question came in, Pat, that, that was addressed earlier in the week amongst the pro team, and that is one of the draft specifications out there still noted 510 pounds minimum cementitious when using fly ash, but that is not going to be carried over to the new version. Am I right. correct in that? Right. Okay. Yep. So again, thank you for bringing that clarification up because many of you uh, will, will sing seeing that the draft specification that went out with the 510 in that. Um, all right, another question that we have here. All right, uh, we have uh, section 1001 is in S2 and S3. How do we know if a bridge is a 40 or 75 year old uh, structure or service life? Um, we're gonna have to take, take a look at that, but um, I think the conservative approach would be, if I may, Pat, that designing for an S3 is going to cover everything that we need. So that is probably the, the prudent source that we would advise all our producers to take at this moment. Do you agree? Correct. Yes. Um, again, if, if, if something different, I, if they, somebody really needs to know, then you're going to have to go to the designers to see, um, you know, what they designed it under. Wouldn't that be on the shop drawing for the, the plans when a job is let? Uh, that I don't know. All right, Pat, you mentioned earlier in your presentation the, the, the two-year test. Um, that's something that many people aren't familiar with. If you could uh, kind of tell everybody what they need to do to get that started with you at the lab. Um, basically, if, if you have an aggregate that is an, at a higher um, reactivity class and you would like to try it at a lower reactivity class, um, we, have, we have space in here to do it, but again, it, it, it's going to be limited to how many we can do, especially when we start getting back in, or when we start um, testing with the retesting of, of, of all the aggregates again. So. Basically, we would need to know, um, you know we would need to know what aggregate you want tested and at what percentage, um, and then uh, we would actually need the aggregates, you know, sent in here into the lab. We would do up the mixed designs, do up the prisms, and start the testing. Um, if if a producer is interested in that, um, please. Uh, send me an email and, and, and let me know and I can get you started on that process. Okay, and um, uh, next question that came in, uh, do you anticipate there being a strike-off letter being sent out to address all this? Um, there will, something, um, yeah, something will be going out to address everything because um, this will be, you know, pretty much retroactive to all construction projects that are, are out there, as, as well as new ones that are being led. Okay, all right. Um, thank you. Um, all right, that is all the time that we have questions for today. I know there's a few more questions on there. We have them. We have your name and email. We will try to address them offline. As Mark said earlier, here's my contact information. If you need a copy of the handout and weren't able to get that, 
please jot that that down. We have a couple of people who send me their questions asking for that handout to be sent to them. We will make sure it gets to them. And at the same time, we'll look for that link coming up uh, on on that'll get you to this recording and also have our contact information on it. So with that being said, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, you have our contact information. So we appreciate your time today and uh, thank you.